This week we're going to be talking about light and matter. This is really important because when we do astronomy, really all we have is light and how light interacts with matter. So we have a nice pretty picture of planetary nebula. By analyzing the light we receive from an object like this, we can work at all sorts of things like how much energy it's putting out, what temperature it is, its size, what it's made of, its speed relative to us, its rotation period, and all sorts of other things. And so we need to understand light to understand how it gives us this information. We're going to start with the speed of light, which is something people take for granted. But it's only just over a hundred years ago since Einstein proposed that the speed of light was a constant and had a finite uh, number, which we now know to be something like this, which is about 300,000 kilometers per second. But how do we know that and how was it first measured? Because it's really tricky. Well, first of all, Galileo tried to measure it. He concluded that it was infinite, but that's because he had no concept of the true speed at which it was moving and didn't have the reactions or the facility to be able to measure it over the short distances he was attempting to measure it. The first person who actually managed to measure it was a Danish guy called Roma. And he actually not spotted it because he was a bit of a ladies' man and he was trying to do something impressive with a date. And so he'd been watching Jupiter and he'd been watching the moons of Jupiter. So here I have, here's the sun, here's the Earth in its orbit, and from Earth you can look and find Jupiter. And here's Jupiter and here's one of its moons. And this moon goes around and around and around. And he knew that the moon had uh, a period, if it's Io, it's about two days, but he knew exactly the period to the second. And so he could look through a telescope and say, hmm, it's going to disappear in a second. And so he had, um, uh, he had the telescope out, and he was out with a date, and he gets it to look through, and he says, look, you see, that moon, it's going to disappear in five, four, three, two, and it went. And obviously his date was really impressed because he managed to do this. Well, he tried to do this again a few months later and found that his timing was off. It didn't disappear exactly when he said. And apart from the fact that he was embarrassed in front of his date, a different lady, um, he was also intrigued because he was a scientist. Why hadn't it disappeared when he expected it to? Well, what's actually happening is something like this. Here we have, here's the Earth. It's on the far side of the sun, more or less, compared to Jupiter. And so when we're looking at it, we're going through something like um, a little less than 2 AU to get across the orbit of, uh, of the Earth, and then out to Jupiter, which is another approximately 4. But six months later, when Jupiter is actually in opposition at its closest point, now we've moved through six months. In six months, Jupiter's only moved a certain portion of its orbit. It, doesn't take, it takes a lot longer to go around its orbit. And now the Earth is almost 2 AU closer. Remember, we had this cord here. It was, it's almost 2 AU closer. And that means that although this moon is going around and around and around, and it takes however many days it takes to go around, the time it takes for the light to get to Earth has changed. It was longer six months ago. It's shorter now. And so it doesn't disappear exactly when you expect it to, or it disappears sooner. So here's both of those together. And basically, the difference in time is something like 16 minutes. This was what he observed, which is about 1,000 seconds. And the, distance, the difference in distance is approximately 2 AU. This is uh, exaggerated in terms of the angle between them. Um, and so that's about 300 million kilometers. And so the speed of light is 300 million kilometers divided by the 1,000 seconds, which is the speed of light. And so that's how the speed of light was first measured, and it was a pretty good measure. Now we use all sorts of experiments that you'll come across in um, Introduction to Modern Physics using uh, nice sensors that can react in a fraction of a second, so we don't need that long baseline. But that was how it was first detected. Now, I know that you all know that light moves in waves, but I want to make sure that we understand what that means. So we have other things that move in waves, like water on the pond, like we see here, but in this case, the, what is moving? The water molecules are moving. It's not that the water molecule that was here is moved out to here, but as this one moves up, it pulls one next to it up and so on, and so you get this propagation of that motion through the water. Likewise, when you have sound, you have the molecules in the air. You can hear me speak because my voice comes out of the speaker and moves the molecules next to the speaker, which move the molecules next to it and next to it, and it propagates through the atmosphere to your ears. So on a pond or in the sea, you have water that's moving, you have um, sound, needs molecules to move. In fact, the movie Alien, which is now 
nearly 35 years old, which is just a little bit scary, um, had the tagline, in space no one can hear you scream, because you're in a vacuum and so nothing propagates. So what is actually moving? Well, there was a guy, very famous British uh, physicist, James Clerk Maxwell, um, who realized that electricity and magnetism were linked, and that in fact, what you have is an electric field and a magnetic field that are basically inducing each other and moving through empty space at the speed of light. And so that was when the idea of electromagnetism was born. And so light is just the movement of electric and magnetic fields through waves. So here we have a kind of idealized structure of this. So you've got um, an electric field moving in a wave. You've got a magnetic field moving in a wave perpendicular to the electric field. And the motion of the wave is perpendicular to both of those. And so you can see this. And so um, and all electromagnetic waves, regardless of their wavelength, will move at the speed of light in a vacuum. Their speed in a medium is different, and we'll come back to that. The wavelength is the distance between two peaks. I'm sure you already know that. And for visible light, that wavelength is in the range of 400 to 700 nanometers. But actually, these days, we can look at wavelengths outside of the visible wavelength range. So we have light as a wave. It's moving. And I'm sure you all know this. But basically, um, you have a wavelength and you have a speed of light. So you also have a frequency at which the peak moves past you. And that frequency um, is given by the number of peaks that move past in a second. And so that gives you nu, which is the frequency. And so there's obviously a reciprocal relationship between the wavelength and the frequency. I hope that this is just a review of this for most of you. And so frequency is the speed of light over the wavelength in appropriate units. Now, I just said that you know, in a vacuum, light travels at the speed of light, 300, 300 million kilometers per second, um, as long as it's in vacuum. But as soon as it enters a medium, the speed can change. And that actually is what allows us to understand that light is made up of these different wavelengths. And so when here it's entering glass, and it's going through, and the speed of the red light is different from the speed of the blue light, and so they get spread out into the different part participant colors. And this spreading out gives us a spectrum. Um, it's a rainbow. And that allows us to analyze what different colors we get. And that's really important. But you can go beyond the visible wavelength. So here we've got visible light in the, it's less than a micron and more than 100 nanometers. At a micron, you're in the infrared. At 100 nanometers, you're in the ultraviolet. Going down in wavelength, up in frequency, we have ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. If we want to go down in wavelength, we've got infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. Um, this is one of my favorites, the microwaves. Actually, microwaves are what we use all the time to do communications. It's the microwave wavelengths that are used for cell phones and radio and TV. Um, it's what all the big uh, astronomy dishes are looking at, or most of them. And so. Um, anybody that thinks that microwaves are going to cause you damage is kidding themselves. There's also a very amusing uh, bit in the movie The Core where the collapse of the magnetic field of the Earth allows microwaves to get through the atmosphere and boil the bay in San Francisco and destroy the Golden Gate Bridge. But we get hit by microwaves all the time because they come through the atmosphere no problem. We'll come back to the idea of what light comes through the atmosphere and what doesn't later. Now, we've talked about light as a wave, but it's also a particle. Um, so sometimes it behaves like a wave, so we can understand its interaction through things like interference patterns and diffraction because it behaves like a wave. But sometimes it behaves like a particle. And the really weird thing is that it can be both at the same time. Those of you that have done some modern physics will understand that small particles do the same thing. So an electron we mostly think of as a particle, but can behave like a wave. And this behavior is called wave-particle duality. For light, we call the particles of light photons. And you can think of it as being a packet of energy. And so a photon has a specific energy that's proportional to the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the higher the amount of energy in a packet. And it's related by Planck's constant, which is written down here. Um, we have the energy of a photon is Planck's constant times the frequency, or you can put it in wavelength. So it's inversely proportional to the wavelength. And so. Photons can be thought of as particles of light, but they also have a wave nature. So you have to be a little bit careful about how you think about it. And so here we have just the, getting into the idea of the energy of these. If you've got red light, 
it's got a longer wavelength, it's got a lower frequency, and so it's a lower energy. Um, we also think of that as being cooler. If you have violet light, it's got a shorter wavelength, a higher frequency, and therefore higher energy. If you go up in this direction, you get higher and higher energies, and this is one of the reasons that ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays are dangerous to us, whereas infrared and microwaves and radio waves tend not to be very dangerous to us because they're low in energy. Now, what is the evidence that we have light and photons? Well, things like um, sunburn. You don't get sunburn sat in a room where you have lights. The lights are not giving off ultraviolet. And that means that in order to cause the chemical reaction that gives rise to the sunburn, or a tan, you must have uh, a threshold energy. You have to be above a certain energy in the packet. And so you must have one packet of energy that's big enough. And you can't just accumulate energy. You need to have UV photons. So you can sit for as long as you like in a room with lights on and never get burned. But you can sit out in the sun for a very short time, especially on my skin, and end up bright red. Um, and that is one of the pieces of evidence. Um, also, things like photography. It used to, this is less true now, although even with the CCD, uh, the, the types of cameras that people have on their phones, it's still true to some extent that the uh, pixels are reacting to the photons of light. But with uh, old-fashioned film, you would have a chemical reaction where the photon has to react with uh, the chemical in the film and cause it to change. And again, you needed to have uh, a certain amount of um, energy per photon in order to make that reaction happen. For those of you who've done um, some modern physics, we also have the photoelectric effect. So if you've got a piece of metal and it's under visible light, it's probably not doing much, but if you put it under ultraviolet light, you can cause it to emit um, electrons. Basically, the electrons get enough energy from the ultraviolet photons to escape. And that's the intro to light. We will move on and talk a little bit about how it interacts with matter shortly.